Uh, very good morning to you all. Hope you all are, all are doing well and keeping safe. Today we are going to discuss a very important cluster of topics, uh, extremely important from the exam perspective. All right, so let's start right away. So as I mentioned to you all, today we are going to discuss a cluster of topics uh, extremely important from the exam perspective. We are going to have a overview and case based approach for Barter syndrome, Gittleman syndrome, Liddell syndrome, uh, syndromes of the apparent mineral corticoid excess and the congenital adrenal hyperplasia variants, uh, those which are associated with hypertension. So let's uh, start our presentation uh, with this uh, chart, which is very, very important to remember for the purpose of the exams and in clinical practice as well. So when we are dealing with a hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis, when we have a low potassium and a high bicarbonate, we should uh, first look whether the patient is hypertensive or if the blood pressure is normal. This is the first thing which we should do in for the exams. If the blood pressure is normal, then we'll directly go down to the roots of diagnosing between Barter syndrome and Gittleman syndrome. Now, hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis with a normal blood pressure can be Barter syndrome or Gittleman syndrome. How do we differentiate between the two? We'll be seeing more with the case-based approach in the subsequent slides. But the important things to remember from now, in, in Barter syndrome, the magnesium is normal while there is hypercalciuria. So the 24-hour urinary calcium is usually increased in Barter syndrome. On the other hand, in Gittleman syndrome, we'll have a low magnesium, a low serum magnesium. Secondly, the 24-hour urinary calcium will be reduced. So it's also called hypocalciuria. And of course, this will lead to accumulation of calcium in the blood, hypercalcemia. So if blood pressure is normal, to we need to differentiate between then barters and gitlinus. What about if we have hypertension? Now, if we have hypertension with hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis, that's the first diagnosis is Korn syndrome or primary hyperaldosteronism, which we discussed already in our uh, previous lecture. In the second line of the diagnosis, we have Liddell syndrome. Again, Liddell syndrome is hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis along with hypertension. The third in line is the syndromes of apparent mineral corticoid excess. And this, again, all we'll be discussing in detail in subsequent slides with the case-based approach. There are two main uh, reasons for it. it. can be either genetic or acquired. Genetic is due to the inactivating mutation of the 11 beta HSD2 gene, while as acquired is because of the licorice inhibition of the 11 beta HSD2. In terms of the CAH variants or the congenital adrenal hyperplasia variants, there are two uh, deficiencies which we should know which are associated with hypertension. Number one is 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency and number two is 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency. And the primary reason for the uh, hypertension in this case is the deoxycorticosterone excess. Deoxycorticosterone excess. So that's very important to remember. Doc excess. Again, all we'll be discussing in the subsequent slides. But this chart is very, very important to summarize what we are going to discuss in the next sets of slides. Now we looked by the differentiating by the way of hypokalemia. We looked by the differentiating by the way of hypertension and no hypertension. Now we should also know about the levels of the renin and the aldosterone, which we can expect in these cases. And this is uh, again, a very excellent chart demonstrating uh, the uh, variations which we can encounter in this case scenarios, which we are going to discuss. Of course, so for the first to start with, we have high aldosterone and a low renin. Again, discussed in our previous video, 
This is the classical primary aldosteronism. It can be unilateral or bilateral. We discussed these things, the adenoma, the hyperplasias, or it can be familial genetic, which is also called glucocorticoid remediable hypertension. What if there is a low renin and a low aldosterone? That is classically called pseudo primary aldosteronism. Now, why like that pseudo? Because it has the mineral corticoid excess like syndrome. But when we measure the renin and the aldosterone, both are low. Now, this can happen in the syndrome of apparent mineral corticoid excess, which we discussed in the first slide, where there will be a problem with the 11 beta HSD2. This can be genetic or acquired. Acquired will be by the liquorous toxicity. The third cause in this we should remember is Liddell syndrome, which is specifically uh, very important in terms of hypertension, along with the uh, hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis, but will have a low renin and a low aldosterone. And we have the variants of the congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which we again saw in the previous slide, where there will be a problem with the 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency, or if there is a 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency. And we should not forget hypercorticosterism, which is um, Cushing syndrome. Now, all these case scenarios here will have a low aldosterone and a low renin. Don't forget. In uh, cases where we have a high renin and high aldosterone, so this part of the graph, this is what we call as pseudo, this is what we call as secondary aldosteronism. So what we saw here, low renin, low aldosterone, is pseudo primary aldosteronism. A high renin and a high aldosterone is called secondary aldosteronism. So what are the causes and the main causes which we should remember is if the patient is hypertensive with that, then we have renal artery stenosis, we have a renoma, again extremely rare, or we have a coarctation of outer. These are the causes of secondary aldosteronism, also which we call as high renin, high aldosterone. Now, the important causes which we discussed in the first slide, which are associated with no hypertension, or in those the patients are normotensive, Gittleman syndrome and Barter syndrome. Again, has a high renin and high aldosterone, but with normal blood pressure. So this chart, again, extremely important for the exams. In the first chart, we looked how to classify the different cases along with the hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis, and whether they are hypertensive or not. And in this particular chart, we are looking at the levels of the renin and the aldosterone and how they will appear in these various case scenarios. So again, these two charts, extremely important when we are going to solve the next set of cases. Okay, so let's start with the case number one. So here we have a 17 year old teenager who has been referred to the endocrine clinic with an elevated and difficult to control blood pressure. He is also complaining of fatigue and muscle pain. On examination, his blood pressure is 180 by 104 millimeters of mercury, which is very, very high. He does not have any phenotypic features of Cushing's and he has no history of vomiting or diuretic abuse. So this is extremely important in all cases when we are trying to look at hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. So we'll see the labs for this patient that we are always ruling out that there is no history of vomiting or diuretic use or abuse, because that is the main differential which we need to the, differentiate these uh, syndromes from. So let's uh, look at the next set of slides. So what we have here is a 17 year old teenager and we have a high blood pressure to start with. And we have no phenotypic features of Cushing's and no history of vomiting or diuretic abuse. Now let's see the labs. So in the labs, we can see the sodium is slightly on the higher end. The potassium is definitely low, 2.6. Magnesium is normal. Bicarbonate is 32, elevated. Uh, renal functions are normal. We have a low aldosterone level, 84. We have a low plasma renin activity, which is at 0.2. We have a very low deoxycorticosterone in this patient and we have a 24-hour urinary free cortisol, which is normal. So now the first thing which we uh, will uh, go back to that slide, to that graph again, so that we rule out the other causes. So here we have a young teenager who is having hypertension, 
and who is having a hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis based on the lab scenario and a low aldosterone and a low renin and also there is a low doc which we should remember now if we go to this chart if we need to see the second part of this chart so we are dealing with low renin low aldosterone as in our case now if it was for hypercortisolism there will be some features of cushings as we saw in this case there were no features how we will rule out 11 beta hsd 2 problem whether there is an inhibition happening there is no history of any liquid is used and again uh, in uh, this particular case scenario we will have a high cortisol in the urine and the expression study for our urinary cortisol was normal what about uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia in congenital adrenal hyperplasia we'll have a high doc in this patient the doc was low so we are left with with the diagnosis of liddle syndrome so yes in the first case where we have a hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis with a low renin a low aldosterone young patient who is hypertensive we are talking about liddle syndrome so what is liddle syndrome liddle syndrome is autosomal dominant the easier way to remember it is by the mnemonic lad uh, it is an autosomal dominant condition and the mutation in the gene is again important for the exams it is uh, at the level of the epithelial sodium channels which we call inac the scnn1b or the scnn1g gene so that's important to remember for the mcqs patients may present with high blood pressure like our patient hypokalemia if he is present at an early age hypokalemia high blood pressure metabolic alkalosis and very important it they will have a suppressed renin and a suppressed aldosterone and a low or an unmeasurable doc levels as was our patient now treatment usually includes a low sodium diet with potassium sparing diuretics okay now in this particular case scenario especially liddles the spironolactone is not effective because spironolactone is mainly working at the mineralocorticoid receptor what medication we need particularly in this particular syndrome is something which can act directly on the sodium channel something which will block this enac activity and this is uh, done by the amaloride and the triamterene which are the potassium sparing diuretics of choice in liddle syndrome So this concludes our first case of Liddle syndrome. Let's move on to case number two. So here we have a fourteen-year-old boy who has been referred with muscle weakness and cramps. Now see his blood pressure. His blood pressure is normal. Uh, no history of vomiting or diuretic abuse. He has some history of polyuria and polydipsia since one month. so the free view of this particular lecture has ended uh, for access to this full lecture session please subscribe to my lecture series which is total of 60 lectures till date uh, these uh, will be provided access to via paid subscription plan and uh, all the paid subscribers will be given a lifetime access to all my existing 60 videos lectures which are already on the youtube channel plus all the upcoming new videos so whatever lectures or sessions i'll be doing in coming weeks months and years all of them will be uh, given access to in the same subscription plan so for the full subscription details please email me on mazirules@gmail.com or whatsapp me on 00971557434794 and have the same number on the telegram app as well uh, just to give a brief overview of the full lecture series so it includes uh, different topics across diabetes and endocrinology for so diabetes itself is there are around 19 lectures which i have done across different topics which are useful for the exams as well as for the clinical endocrinology practice in terms of uh, high yield topics for specialty exam and european board exam there are around 9 sessions which have covered all the previous exam recalls as well as all the high yield topics and themes which are frequently encountered in the Uh, specialty exams and the european board exams in terms of thyroid apart from the thyroid cancer guidelines which were recently uh, published plus there are other sessions on different topics uh, related to thyroid 
uh, across the spectrum of thyroid disease in terms of adrenal as well, covering all the important topics or sessions which are frequently encountered in exams and in clinical practice. There are two very good sessions on lab endocrinology by Dr. Well Murugan, very helpful for those preparing for uh, DM endo or DNB endocrinology as well. In terms of pituitary also have covered all the important sessions on all the important topics which are frequently encountered in clinical practice and the exams. There are a few sessions on the inherited endocrine syndromes as well. Very important sessions on reproductive endocrinology about uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, gynecomastia, hirsutism, PCOS, diagnosis, evaluation, management. There is a uh, sessions on calcium and bone metabolism, on familial lipid disorders, and uh, sessions on pediatric endocrinology as well. So just to let you know that there are many more sessions coming up. And as I mentioned, that in the same subscription plan or same subscription fee, you will be provided access to all my existing 60 lectures plus all my forthcoming lectures. So thank you very much for subscribing. Thank you very much for supporting.